My name is James Noriega. I'm the curator and historian here at Yankster Museum. Uh, Yankster Museum is a nonprofit museum uh, dedicated to the restoration and preservation of historic American aircraft. So we uh, house and restore uh, uh, American aircraft here, historic ones. Uh, we have over 200 aircraft in the collection, and we're constantly growing. Uh, so looks exciting. Let's it, go yeah. see it. So, well, we'll be starting with cars, though, here. Well, we do have a few cars in here. We do, like, uh, old Americana. So we, here we have a 1923 Maxwell. Uh, it is a running car. We kind of like to pretend here that it was Jack Benny's. It probably wasn't, but who knows? He was known to have liked the uh, Maxwells. This is actually the only replica in the museum right here. It's a uh, replica of the original Wright Flyer, the 1903 Wright Flyer flown by the Wright brothers. It's, as I mentioned, the only replica in the museum, but it is a life-size uh, replica of the original. Uh, various aircraft. The whole concept of the museum is you sort of walk through history. So we have aircraft ranging all the way from the First World War throughout the 1920s and the 1930s. You can kind of see how the designs change. Uh, most of the aircraft that have reciprocating engines, uh, that is ones with propellers, are restored to flyable condition. Um, so we are a real stickler for the details here. The, uh, you know, they're not just replicas. They're not just dioramas. They're the real deal. So why don't you just tell me, what, what are we passing by? So like this one is actually one of my personal favorite aircraft in the museum. This is a Curtis Robin. The Curtis Robin... Uh, it was a notable aircraft in the 1920s and 1930s, probably made most famous by the fact that this was the type of airplane flown by Ronway Corrigan, who was a friend of Charles Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh being, of course, the first man to successfully fly solo across the Atlantic. Uh, Douglas Corrigan wanted to do that as well. Unfortunately, he couldn't get the required permit to go across the Atlantic in his Curtis Robin, so he did it without permission. Uh, and his excuse to his dying day was, I'm sorry, the weather was bad that day, I couldn't see where I was going, and I flew the wrong way. And <laughs> forever afterwards, people called him Ronway Corrigan, but... Uh, Pretty amazing when you consider flying across the Atlantic and something like that. <laughs> a lot of rare aircraft in the museum. We have a lot of aircraft you just simply will not find anywhere else in the world. Uh, one of the notable ones right here, this being a Collect KD-1 Autogyro from the 1930s. Uh, these were built for the U.S. Army uh, in the 1930s as observation aircraft. So you'll note that the two cockpits, one for a pilot, one for an observer. Uh, the idea being that uh, they could fly and spot for artillery or spot the enemy or whatever is going on on the ground. Uh, interesting, only seven of these particular models were ever built. This is the last remaining example in the world. There's a number of aircraft in this hangar that are the last of their type, so uh, very, you know, very rare. But this, this one uh, seems like uh, it has a, it's like a helicopter yes. as well. So it, it's not a helicopter, nor is it an airplane. It's its own class of aerial vehicle known as an autogyro. You don't see them as much as you used to back in the day, but you, there are still some people who like flying them. Unlike a helicopter, autogyros cannot take off and land vertically. They just fly straight, just right. like a... Uh, an airplane does, but they do it in a very short amount of space to take off and land, uh, short takeoff and landing, so they, they are still very versatile. It was basically the granddaddy to the helicopter. <laughs> uh, other rare aircraft, this is some part of our World War II collection right here, a P-51A Mustang, one of the few A-model Mustangs left in the world, extremely rare. Uh, we have an M3N Yellow Apparel. This is a U.S. Navy aircraft. It actually has the distinction of only be, being the only aircraft in U.S. military history never built by a private firm. It was never built by like Lockheed or Boeing. The U.S. Navy actually built it themselves. And it was a, used as a World War II trainer. Uh, fairly rare to have. We actually have quite a number in the museum. This is the rarest one because it is actually one of the few they built with pontoons to land on the water. Another P-51 Mustang. This is the more famous D model. Uh, very nice airplane. There's, uh, we actually do the research for the historical markings. So all the markings you'll see on our airplanes, they've all been heavily researched. We keep a uh, library stocked with records on where these airplanes have been. So we do a lot of research to get uh, markings period correct. Uh, another notable example being this one, P-38 Lightning, this gray one on your left, this one, uh, this one here, right. on the left right here, yeah, this one is uh, another one, you'll see the note, the, the uh, marking there, the Donald Duck, that was actually, uh, we actually contacted the Disney company to find that marking, because Walt Disney personally designed that for that squadron, uh -huh. so when we were actually redoing the paint scheme for it, we actually were able to contact the Disney company, and they, were, they sent us the original scans, and that's what we were able to do, but another very historic airplane, the P-38 Lightning, uh, not as there's several out there flying. This is, however, the only one left in the world that is actually a photo reconnaissance version. So it had the longer nose for uh, secret camera missions, photo recon. So very, very rare. Arguably the most valuable aircraft in the collection. A lot of other uh, neat aircraft. Traveler 6000. Uh, notably, the Traveler Company was uh, founded by uh, three young men who all previously worked together uh, for Consolidated, but. Later on, they got together and they formed the Traveler Company, and their names were Clyde Cessna, Walter Beach, and Lloyd Stearman. <laughs> so the big three guys, and then, of course, they all got famous and made their own companies. Uh, B-25 Mitchell, another nice airplane. Uh, this was a medium bomber in World War II. 
Uh, and it's very cool because we do have an original Norden bombsite installed. The Norden bombsite was considered a top secret piece of technology during World War II, so top secret they wouldn't even leave it inside an airplane after a mission. They'd always remove them. They didn't know the Germans had already stolen the technology, but it was still considered top secret. Very cool airplane. This is the same type of airplane Jimmy Doolittle flew on the famous Doolittle raid. Uh, very nice airplane. Deck. You want to look in the bomb bay really quick? Sure. Watch your head. Here we go. Oops. Oh, let me watch your. Well, I draw it through there on the floor. There we are. Oh wow. So this particular B-25, uh, it actually served as a TB-25 during World War II as a trainer. After the war, it went to Australia. They used it as a fire bomber to fight fighters. Uh, when we acquired it, we basically our team basically rebuilt this bomb bay uh, from scratch using original parts. So um, you can imagine the amount of work that goes into this. Right, exactly. You can see the bomb yeah. racks right here. So the access port up there, so the flight engineer could look down here and visually confirms your bomb had released, and if not, potentially climb down here and try and kick them loose. Wow. <laughs> 